Here we go. We're in James. This is going to be the last one, right? This is, our, this is our final few verses in the book of James. We're in James chapter 5, and uh, we're, we're going to begin in verse 13 today. And so uh, go ahead and turn over there if you would with me. And I'm just going to read this in its entirety, and then we'll, uh, we'll go from there to see what the Lord uh, has to say. <clears throat> oh, actually, this is what the Lord has to say. We'll go from there and see what, uh, how the Lord has given some words for me, and I hope that it'll, uh, it'll be uh, words for, for you. So, uh, verse 13, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wonder from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. It's the reading of God's Word. Now, as I said, this is the, our final message uh, in this book. And if you have been with us over this period, you know we've gone verse by verse. Thanks to Peyton last week and appreciate him filling in and doing verses 7 through, through 12 for me. But I hope this has been helpful to you. Uh, I hope the book of James is one that you'll go back to and read it regularly and often. It's so practical. Right? There's just so much to glean from this. And, and, and I hope that you've uh, been able to see how uh, we're called to have a living faith. Right? Not just the faith that's professed or one time or that we say we have, but a faith that is lived out, a faith ultimately that works. And as James closes things out today in this letter, he talks about the importance of prayer. Now, I know that I've shared this story with you before, but I think it's applicable here. It's a story that Richard Haverson tells. It was back, he, was a, he was a chaplain of the Senate back in the early 80s. When school prayer was really uh, was sort of really a big issue, and uh, similar maybe in t today as uh, we were, he, you know, Ten Commandments are sort of being debated again. But he says that his senator uh, went to a church in Virginia. It was a men's prayer breakfast, and it was about 300 men there. And of course, the question was asked quickly: Well, what are you going to do to to uh, return prayer to our schools? And Halverson said the senator responded like this: He said, "Okay, how many of you believe we need prayer uh, in our public schools?" 300 hands went up. And then asked the, the senator said, okay, how many of you pray with your kids every day? Three hands went up. And the point he was making is that we tend to be more serious about the subject of prayer than we do the practice of prayer. Is it true for you? I mean, I think it's probably true for, for many of us, right? We, we tend to be more serious about the, the subject than actually the practice. Why is that? Uh, well, there's probably several reasons that we could list of why prayer sort of sometimes goes down on the list for, uh, you know, for our life and for whatever race. One reason may be just the pace of life, right? We're just so busy. And maybe because we run and we run and we run, then prayer just sort of gets pushed to the, to the bottom, if, if, if at all. Maybe uh, a moment, maybe at a mealtime or before we fall asleep. Or maybe we don't pray because we're impatient. Maybe it's when we're impatient. God doesn't answer our prayers fast enough, right? We think, well, if I can order a package from Amazon, it can be here tomorrow. Surely God can deliver my request, right, pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, maybe it's a lack of understanding. Maybe you don't pray because you just don't really know what to do, right? I mean, some of you have grown up in church. You've had your parents pray. It's sort of a second language to you. For others, it's like, I don't really know what to do, what to say. How, you know, how do I pray? Or maybe... And this one maybe cuts a little harder, but maybe you just don't value it. Maybe it just really isn't that important to you. Remember, this constant theme in the book of James is that a profession of faith isn't valuable unless it leads to a life that's evidenced by faith. Now, we can say 
that, you know, something is important to us, but how we live our life proves it to be true or false. And so we can say the same thing about prayer. Yeah, prayer matters to me, right? But maybe not as much as that Netflix series or those 30 minutes extra sleep or social media or goofing off with friends or, you know, like that, those things are high on the list. Prayer really, really low. Or maybe it's because you don't think it really makes a difference. Uh, maybe that's the case for you. Like, eh, I don't know. But remember what James said in that passage? Look at verse 16 again, the second part of that. He said, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And there may have been seasons in your life where you would affirm that, but maybe somewhere along the line, something changes and we begin to doubt God's word. That maybe despite our prayers, we don't get the job. The guy moves on. We fail a test. We don't get into the school. Despite our prayers, our children continue to make poor choices. Despite our prayers, sometimes the people we love don't get better, and they still die. And when those things happen, it rattles our faith. Sometimes to the point actually of, of retreat. And if that's you this morning, my hope and my prayer as we wrap up this book is that you'll discover the power and beauty of prayer, maybe in a, a, a unique, unique or maybe uh, just be reminded of that today. And so uh, James, I think, from this text gives us six occasions when it's appropriate to pray. First is this, we pray when we're suffering. You pray when you're suffering. Look at verse 13 again. He said, is anyone among you in trouble? Let him pray. Let him pray. You, anybody, you probably don't remember how James start, started this letter. It was a long time ago, right? It was like 11 weeks ago. We've, we've been going through this. But he begins this letter by talking about uh, people who are enduring trials and persecutions and, and uh, suffering. And now he ends this letter by saying, okay, the, the best way that you can do that when you suffer, when you deal with trials, is by praying. Some of you are probably familiar with the name Elizabeth Elliot. Uh, Elizabeth Elliot and uh, uh, her, uh, uh, her uh, husband Jim was uh, martyred in the 1950s. They were going to take the gospel to the Alka Indians, and, and uh, he was killed. Um, and, you know, they've made a movie about it. You've probably, maybe you've seen that. I think it's called The End of the Spear. But um, tragically, right, after his death, at some point she remarries that husband dies of cancer four years later. Elliot obviously has gone through some difficult things, but she said, you know, when you're suffering, God gives you a peace that you don't get otherwise. She said it's different. It's supernatural, right? And some of you, you've told me the same thing, right? You, you've suffered a trial, and you felt God's presence in that, and that's what suffering does, doesn't it? Suffering, unlike maybe anything else, drives us to our knees it drives us to our knees just ask someone who's dealing with a broken relationship a loss of income a death of a loved one someone if you're sitting in the hospital and you say hey how's your prayer life been they're going to say oh it's been good all right it's been good you don't have to you don't have to worry about about that yeah I, i've been praying nobody likes to suffer but it drives us to a dependence upon god so we pray when we suffer secondly we pray when we're happy, content. Look at verse 13. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. You know, I think it's sort of ironic that uh, the times in our life that things are most peaceful and most blissful is what happens. Our prayer life suffers. That's when our prayer life suffers. Most of us don't have a problem praying when we're hurting because we need something from God. But when things are going good, how often do we withhold our praise? Our prayers, rather. But your prayers should be full of praise. And they should be full of thanksgiving. In fact, Paul says it like this in Colossians 4. He said, devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. You know, I think for so many of us, if we would add Thanksgiving into our prayer life every day, it would be transformational. Thanksgiving. Listen, some of you, you're looking for a breakthrough in prayer today. Like, I, like just give me something, preacher, like, I, I need a break. Listen, I'm telling you, when it comes to your prayer life, if you will add praise and Thanksgiving and make that a priority, it will change your perspective completely. 
there's two sides to prayer. Okay, one, you've got a side where you are petitioning God, and God allows us to do this. Like, we're able to come to Him, and we're able to ask Him, you know, things that, uh, you know, something's going on in our life, and ask Him to intervene. The other way is through communion with God. And this is simply being still before our Creator. This is praising His holy name. This is learning to delight in His presence. And this will take prayer from something that you do simply when you have to, out of a need, out of obligation, to having a divine moment with your Savior who has changed your life in so many ways. Uh, listen to how David prays in Psalm chapter 6 or 63. He says this, God, you are my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. My body faints for you in a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. So I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. My lips will glorify you because your faithful love is better than life. So I will bless you as long as I live at your name. I will lift up my hands. You satisfy me as with rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I think of you as I lie on my bed, I meditate on you during the, during the night watches because you are my helper. I will rejoice in the shadow of your wings. I follow close to you. Your right hand holds on to me. Does that sound like a man who prays just out of obligation? Prays because he has to pray? No, no. He, when he, like this is a man who has come to know God. All right? When he prays, he says, I think about him. I meditate on God. I long for you. I search for you. He says, nothing or nobody can satisfy me like you in this dry and desert land. He says, I set my gaze on you. Right? Do you see what he's doing here? Listen, if you want to break through in prayer, like this is it. Learn who God is. Meditate on his word. Seek his face. Delight in his presence. Praise him and thank him when you're happy. When things are at peace, he deserves that. He deserves our praise. We pray when we're content. Third, we pray when we're sick. We pray when we're sick. Look at verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, what does that mean? Well, anointing with oil served two different purposes. Uh, one purpose was ceremonial. And so it was used to set someone apart. <clears throat> Remember when Samuel anointed Saul, declared him as the king? He, uh, the, he anointed him. And that anointing symbolized that God's, uh, God's presence and being set apart by God. Well, the anointing that James refers to here is medicinal. Remember in the story of the Good Samaritan that Jesus tells? The Samaritan poured oil on the victim, took him to an inn, and cared for him. In other words, he treated his wounds. And so when James tells us to call on the elders and be anointed with oil, it's not just a formula that's going to guarantee your healing, okay? But it's a proclamation. It's asking God's blessing. It's asking God's healing. It's asking God's presence in your life. And the result very well may lead to your healing. My, my buddy David, who was here two weeks ago, one of those guys, um, he, they had a special prayer service at their church just this past week, and they offered up, <clears throat> you know, a, an opportunity to pray. And he said that, uh, that someone came up, and he, they had, that this guy had a, an illness. They could not figure out what it was. <clears throat> they didn't know what was going on with him. But he said, and they, <clears throat> excuse me, they prayed for him. And he said this week they got a call about, uh, I think it was Thursday, and they said, hey, the doctors have called and said, we finally figured out what was going on with you. And they said it was treatable, and it wasn't anything that was life-threatening. That's, listen, we rejoice in that. We rejoice in answered prayer. That's something that we're happy to do here. Listen, we're, we're willing to pray with you. I'm willing to pray with you any time. But if you're dealing with a nagging illness, if you're dealing with a life-threatening disease, we will do just as James says here, and we will anoint you with oil and, and pray. And again, this is something that we're happy to do. The, the bigger issue, I think, for, for us maybe is why don't you ask the elders to pray for you more often in general? 
right? It's, it's a way that we can exercise servant leadership. It's a way that we can, uh, you know, we're happy to do that anytime. We're happy to do that today. We'll do it after the service, whatever it may be. The more difficult part of this text is what he says in verse 15. And he says, And the prayer offered in faith will make a sick person well. And the Lord will raise him up. If they've sinned, they'll be forgiven. And, and this is <clears throat> a little more difficult because probably everybody in here has prayed a prayer of faith. Believing, knowing God can heal a sick person. And yet they don't get better. And so what does James mean? Well, I think it's twofold. One, belief, first belief and faith are an important characteristic of prayer life. In our prayer life, we, we, we should have confidence that God hears us. We, we should hear like, that God is big enough to answer our prayers. The same God who performed miracle after miracle in Scripture can do the same thing in our life. Listen, for you, don't be afraid. Somebody asks you to pray for them. Don't be afraid to put your hands on them and pray for them and ask God for, for them to be healed, like for a sick person to be made well. But the second part and aspect of this, that what we tend to miss sometimes, is when James is talking about prayer of faith making someone well, he's not simply placing the answer or denial on that prayer on our back. Faith is important, but so is God's will. 1 John 5 says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of Him. See, there's going to be times when our pray, we pray a prayer of faith, it's in alignment with God's will, and God powerfully answers that prayer even supernaturally. Don't be afraid to pray big prayers. Don't be afraid to pray and believe in faith that God will answer them. We serve a God who time after time after time tells us to do this, and we see it in Scripture, and we've seen it here, right? God's answer, our prayer, like you, some of you have talked to me. We've seen those answers to our prayers here. Sometimes we gloss over the small ones because, well, they're just not all that dramatic, but, but God answers small and, and big. Um, I asked Christy if I could, you know, just say something about her this, this morning, right? Many of you know um, she was diagnosed with ALS back in 2017. Uh, ALS, if you don't know, uh, it's, it's fatal. There's, there's no cure. And when she was diagnosed, I mean, we were all devastated. But we've been praying for her, and you've been praying for her, and we've been thanking God that her symptoms have been, have been good overall and progressing slowly as far as we knew. But, but after a, another series of tests and doctor's appointment, Christy, this past January, the doctor said, you don't have ALS. And he said, you're, 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 you know, you're still dealing with a, a neurological deal, and, but it's treatable. It's not fatal. And, and that doctor said, I can't say that you never had ALS. I don't know, but he said it was an answer to prayer, right? It was an answer to prayer. Now, you can be skeptical, and you can think, yeah, well, maybe she was just, just misdiagnosed. Listen, I'm giving God glory for that. I'm giving God praise for that, right? I'm agreeing with her doctor who said it was, it was an answer to prayer. If someone's sick, right, we're going to pray for healing. And if it's medicine, that's fine. God gives us that. Praise God for doctors. Praise God for medicine and healing. It comes through that. Or we're going to pray for God just supernaturally to work, right, beyond medicine, beyond whatever we can do uh, in, human, uh, in a human way. And so we pray, and, and we believe, and we trust. But there's going to be other times when our faith is strong. Our will is a yes, but God's will is still no. And those are hard. Those times are hard. And I don't have a good answer for that, but, but I know we're not alone. Remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was going to the cross? He prayed, God, Father, if there's another way to do this, uh, may it be. But he said, not my will, but yours be done. The Apostle Paul had some kind of thorn in his flesh. Had something going on. He prayed three times. God, remove this thorn. Remove this thorn. Remove this thorn. Remember what Jesus said? No, no, my grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in your weakness. You're right where you need to be. And so um, there's certainly mystery there. But when God's will is, a, is, is no here and, and that person goes on, well, we're going to praise God for their ultimate healing. 
And, and I agree with what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, death is no punishment for the believer. It is the gate of endless joy. Praise God for that. So we pray um, when, we, uh, uh, when we're sick. Fourth, we pray when we sin. We pray when we sin. Verse 16. Therefore, con uh, confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. Uh, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now, notice that we don't just simply confess our sins to God, but we confess our sins to one another. And, and really, this prayer, this pastoral prayer that James is saying that you should ask for, it might include an illness or it might include a sin. Verse 15 says, if they've sinned, they will be forgiven. When was the last time you confessed your sin to someone else? Now, when was the last time you allowed someone else to pray for a, like this something in your life that you were dealing with that you kept getting tripped up over and over and over again? Maybe this is where us Protestants can... Maybe, you know, we, we, we could learn maybe something from the Catholic Church where confession's more of a, a normal practice, not for priestly absolution, not for penance over your sin. Only Jesus is sufficient in that, but, but confession is, is good. Confession is what God calls us to do. Listen, Satan would love nothing more than you to be deceived that all you've got to do is if you sin or if you've got something that is just, that you are just, that, that, that the enemy has you tra trapped in, that all you need to do is just to tell God you're sorry when you mess up and move on. Of course, you need to confess your sin to God. But unless that sin gets exposed, you will likely repeat it over and over again. Uh, David says it like this in Psalm 32. <clears throat> He's talking about how sin had hardened him and how he had, it had haunted him. And he said, he said, when I kept silent, my bones wasted. He said, when I kept silent, I was, I was in agony. His hidden sin had him in agony. But he said, I acknowledged my sin, and I was forgiven, and I rejoiced in the Lord. And listen, for some of you today, <clears throat> that's the very thing you need to do. Whether it's publicly or privately or someone else or whoever, to, to, uh, you know, to, to confess that sin, to get that out in the light. And to find healing as a result. Why be so miserable? Why be so miserable? And listen, this is why, you know, groups are important. This is why, you know, we want you in a, in a Sunday school or a small group. or uh, we, we want you to be able to rub elbows with other believers. All right? Find someone. Find someone of the same sex that you can, uh, that will pray for you. That you can pray for. That you, that you can ask for, uh, you know, for help overcoming certain sin. That you can confess your sin to. It's through prayer and getting on our face before God that our hearts are changed and we find healing. Fifth, we pray when our nation needs healing. We pray when our nation needs healing. Look at verse 17. Elijah was a, was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops well, when James talks about the prayer of a righteous person being powerful and effective he uses Elijah as his example you remember Elijah uh, Elijah was a prophet during a time when uh, the wicked king Ahab and his wife Jezebel were reigning and they led Israel into uh, uh, idolatry uh, and um, as a result, God punished the nation, held back rain for over three years. Baal worship was what they were leading them to worship. They believed that Baal controlled the weather. God said, you think Baal controls the weather? Just watch this. And it's not going to rain. It didn't rain for three years. But at the appropriate time, God tells Elijah, okay, it's time. And so what does Elijah do? Okay, God, go ahead. No, no. He goes and he prays. And he goes to Mount Carmel. And he goes on the top and he falls down before the Lord and he prays. And James says he praised, uh, prayed earnestly. And by the way, this is a reminder that the ministry of prayer isn't easy. It's hard work. Now, Paul talks about how he wrestled in prayer for his churches. Some of you wonder, what can I do for my church? Well, you know, what can, listen, pray. Please pray. 
Pray for me. Pray for uh, you know, our leaders. Pray for our staff. Pray for our children. Pray for our families. Pray for single people. Pray for kingdom workers. Pray for, like Elijah prayed earnestly to God. And God opened up the skies. And to the, the, you know, he prayed that God would bring rain, and he did. And James makes the point. You may think Elijah's just this prophet that's, you know, that you need to put over here in a Marvel superhero character. No, no, he says, he's a man just like us. He was human, just like, just like we are. Elijah was praying for the nation of Israel, but more, most importantly, you know what he's praying for? He was praying for the glory of God. And again, yesterday, as, as, we, you know, as we look and we think about our own country and you know, an, an assassination a, an attempt. It, it's a reminder how much our country needs prayer, how much we need prayer, and how God is calling us to be light in a dark world, how God calls us to be different, to be salt, how Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. We're called to be peacemakers. This is who we are. Listen, there is so much anger and division and depravity all throughout politics. But we're called to pray. We pray for the former president as he recovers. We pray for our current president as he governs. We pray for healing and direction in our country. We're not Israel, but, but we pray for our country. And ultimately, we pray for the glory of God in all things. So we pray when a nation, your nation needs healing. We, we pray. And in six. We pray when Christians stray from the truth and people who are lost. We pray for that. Look at verse 19. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Now, James doesn't mention prayer here, but I think it's implied. He's talking about a believer who gradually moving away from the will of God in their life. Sometimes we refer to this as, as backsliding, right? You're, you're, you're backsliding into this state of unbelief. And it's a dangerous condition to be in because not only are we likely harming ourselves as we pull away from God, but the continual rejection of Christ might be evidenced that that person or we are like the one in Jesus's parable who received the word and rejoiced for a while but it didn't last it didn't last we didn't endure and James though he doesn't include those who are um, uh, who are completely outside of Christ here I think this is a category that's applicable as well for our prayers don't you listen I, I want us to pray for for the sick and we do that regularly but we also need to be praying for people who are outside of Jesus I mean listen I don't have to give you the stats this morning you know this you may think you you know you may we I think we get this listen there are thousands and thousands of people right here in our area who are outside of Christ and James says your prayer may save them from death God may use you and me to lead people from death to life. And listen, one of the simplest ways that you can do that, here's the simple, easiest way, just pray for somebody this week and invite them to church next week. I mean, just pray and invite. And listen, next week's a perfect opportunity to, to invite somebody. We're going to kick off an, a, 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 new, a new series of messages. We're actually going to do another book study. This time it's going to go to the Old Testament. We're going to go to Ruth. It's going to be a lot of fun, okay? It's going to be a lot of fun. And so pray, invite. And uh, who knows how God may use a single invitation to change someone's life, maybe, maybe forever. And so as we kind of round third here, let me, just, let me just say this, and let me just remind you of this. It's through the power of prayer that God moves and works among us and through us. It's through the power of prayer that God moves and works among us and through us. This is a mystery, okay? This is one of these things. This is a mystery how God does this, how God allows us to participate in what He is doing. God's will is going to be done. But here's how the, listen, in His wisdom, in His providence, our prayers matter. Our prayers make a difference. Our prayers accomplish His will. And it's, 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 it's mind-boggling to me. It's too much for me to grasp, but that's just the way Scripture 
lays it out. One theologian said, prayer is so great that everywhere you look in the Bible, it's there. Why? Because everywhere God is, prayer is. Have you thought about that? Just trace Scripture. Just think about Scripture. Go back to Genesis and the patriarchs. What do we see? We see them, we, we see them praying to God. Uh, the, the King David, right? In the book of Psalms, over and over again, we see these majestic, uh, majestic prayers. Uh, Solomon, um, he prays as he dedicates the temple uh, at the end, uh, in Job. At, at the end, uh, God tells Job, hey, your friends, uh, I'm going to punish your friends unless you pray for them. Daniel was nearly killed for his insistence to pray three times a day later even though god had already said the exile is going to last 70 years what do we see daniel doing we see daniel praying that the exile would take place and what happens it does god is using the prayers nehemiah when nehemiah goes to rebuild the wall around jerusalem what does he do a series of prayers and wise leadership Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and he showed them what a life of prayer looked like. In fact, Jesus drew his final breath, praying. And the early church, what do we see? Well, we see after his death, his disciples being constantly in prayer. That's how it's described in the book of Acts. They were constantly in prayer. It's through the power of prayer that God moves and works among us and through us. And so what about you? How's your prayer life? More the, just the idea of prayer or are we actually, actually praying? They, they say that when Christianity reached a certain part of Africa, there was a, that the natives would go off every day for a time of prayer in the jungle. And they would find their own secluded place, and they would get down on their knees, and they, and they would pray there. And it was pretty easy to tell where they were playing because that area would get worn down. And if a brother neglected to, uh, his time of praying, the others would come to him, and he would use this phrase, Brother, the grass grows on your path. And it was their way of saying, you're, you're not communing with the Lord. You're not praying. And I can usually tell when the grass is growing on my path. Can't you? I can tell it in my heart. I can tell it in the way I view people. I can tell it in the way I treat people. I can tell it. I can tell it. Is the grass growing on your path this morning? What's your prayer life look like? Listen, God's calling us to be people of prayer. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. It's not something that we think, oh, okay, the preacher talked about prayer. Now I've got to go home and pray. Now I've got to go home and find a place. I'm telling you, if you would just start, if you would look for an opportunity each day, maybe a quiet place, same place, over and over again, and you just, or even as you go throughout your day, just commune with the Lord. I'm telling you, there is nothing, nothing like it, and nothing like that you will grab. The intimacy of prayer, you know how it's made possible? It's made possible through Jesus, our high priest. He, he, he like his sacrifice, paved this way for you and I to, to, to be able to have an intimate relationship with God. When Jesus was on the cross, what happened? The veils tore. And so now we don't have to go through a man. You don't have to go through a priest or a preacher or anybody else. We go directly to him through our high priest, Jesus, and he hears our prayers, and he answers our prayers, and we're able to commune with him, and we're able to be like David and send, just search after him and seek after him and delight in his presence in a presence in a dry and weary land. That's where we find hope and we find our water. And did you know that your relationship with God, ultimately, it begins by crying out to Him in prayer. That we cry out to Him. We see this phrase repeated in Scripture over and over again. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so maybe today, this is, your, like, this is what you need to do, is to call on the name of the Lord. To trust in Him for the very first time and to be, to be saved. There's so many blessings so many promises so many privileges of prayer but the greatest promise of all is jesus himself so may we be reminded of that today would you pray with me
Father, we thank you for uh, the privilege and the power of prayer. And God, I, I just pray that just now, maybe there's some out here today that as I'm praying, they, they need to be reminded. And Father, they, they need to be, um, just to feel your presence in their life today. God, there, there may be a certain sin that they're dealing with that they need to confess, or, or there, there may be a, uh, something going on in their life that they need to, to cry out to you for. And uh, Father, uh, I pray that you would uh, give them the, the courage and, and uh, the ability to, uh, to be able to do that today. Father, we thank you, though, that you make it all possible through Jesus. and We place our faith and trust in him. And, and uh, God, we're just so grateful. We're so grateful for, for you and all that you do. Lord, we just ask us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, we're going to give you a chance as we sing. And you can come forward for prayer. I'm happy to pray with you. I know uh, Brad is going to be up front here as well, one of our other elders. And he's happy to pray for you. If you just want to come forward for prayer on your own, you can you can take a knee up, up front here and, and, and spend some time in the Lord. Or if you have another decision, you're welcome to do that as well. Let's be standing.